Okay, okay good morning. My name is Lorraine. I am an alcoholic. Good morning. So we're going to start this class off with the surrender prayer, please. God, 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 God grant me the surrender to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That's what today. So this class this morning is on step one. We admitted we was powerless over alcohol that our lives had become unmanageable. We're going to talk about the disease concept, and the disease means away from comfort. Let me give you a little background. It was a doctor, matter of fact, it was a couple of doctors that studied alcohol, there's alcoholics. And really the doctors didn't like their work with alcoholics because they thought that all we did was lie and didn't know how to tell the truth. So it was a doctor named Dr. Silkworth that studied the alcoholic for a while. What people don't know is Dr. Silkworth, when the stock market crashed, Dr. Silkworth was in the stock market and he lost all his money. So he went to a man that he knew named Towns, Mr. Towns, and he asked Mr. Towns for a job and he went to the Towns Hospital. And when he went to the Towns Hospital, he really studied alcoholics. He was real interested in alcoholics. And what he found out was, can you read the first paragraph for me? Top on alcoholic. The physician who, at our request, gave us this letter has been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. In this statement, he confirms what we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. It did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to life, that we were full flight from reality, or we were outright men of defectives. These things were true to some extent, in fact, to a considerable extent, with some of us. But we are sure that our bodies were sickened as well. And I believe any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out the physical factor is incomplete. Anybody that leaves out the physical factor is incomplete. That's what Dr. Silk would find out. So what he realized was that once we put some in our body, we kicked off that physical allergy. And that physical allergy kicked off the phenomenon of craving. Maladjusted is, like if you maladjusted to, if I'm maladjusted to my allergy to uh, strawberries, I'm gonna break out. So the maladjusted, the manifestation of the allergy for the alcoholic is to keep on going, that phenomenon of craving. That's what it is. And so he realized that once we put one in us, it kicked off that phenomenon craving. And we went on a well-known spree. Now, mind you, Dr. Silkworth wanted to know why we couldn't drink like regular people. Like, uh, like uh, you, you got some people that can drink and they're going to go home and go to bed. And then you got moderate drinkers that's going to have a glass, they're going to feel a little bit, and they're going to put that glass down, and they're going to they gonna stop. But with us, we kept on going, and we started acting out. So then what he realized was we was not normal. We, not, we couldn't drink like normal people. Now, we can't leave out the, the mental part. So once we put it in us, then we became restless, irritable, and discontent. Mental obsession means the desire. So then we, we had a desire. We didn't, we wonder where the desire came from. We, we mentally obsessed over that feeling. We liked the effect that the alcohol gave us. If you read, can I ask, I ask somebody to read the other men and women, essentially? Greg, alcoholic. Hey, Greg. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effects produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot after a time differentiate the truth from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontent. Unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks, drinks which they see others taking with impunity. After they have succumbed to the disease again, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful, with a firm resolution not to drink again. This was repeated over and over, and unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope of his recovery. Okay, now, remember, so let's say we stop, remember, I, I, I remember when I was stopped for a day and wonder why the next day I'm picking up. Well, that mental obsession had kicked in. See, I became restless, irritable, and discontent, and the mental obsession kicked in, and I just started drinking again. And once I started drinking, it went into the body, that physical allergy kicked off, and I just kept on going. But the desire came from, 
I like the effect. I like what it, listen, I was small. I didn't like being string bean. I didn't like called, being called skinny penny. I didn't like it. And when I put that alcohol in, in me, it gave me an effect. I thought I was Arnold Schwarzenegger somebody. <laughs> I mean, for real. And I could do anything. I became a bully and everything. So I liked the way it made me feel. I was powerless over alcohol. We was powerless right here. I loved the way it made me feel. I did. And I had a firm resolution not to do it again. And then that mental obsession kicked in. And I don't care. I'm telling my mama I'm just going to the store with your $20. And I never came back. Because that mental obsession kicked in. And I wanted another one. And, didn't, and couldn't wonder. And I wonder why I couldn't stop. I didn't have a clue that I had an allergy to alcohol. See, I know I'm allergic to shellfish. I know I'm allergic to latex. But what I didn't know was that I was allergic to alcohol. And once I put it in me, all bets was off. So I was powerless. But then I got into the solution. And the solution is over here. Powerless, and then I'm gonna gain some power over here. <clears throat> so when I get over here to step two, came to believe that power greater than myself because it restores the sanity, I ended up in the fellowship, that's meetings. Now mind you, meetings alone is not going to keep you clean. Then I got, started reading a big book. Didn't understand it when I first started reading it, but I kept on reading it and kept on reading it. Then I got me a sponsor, my sponsor right here, mm, unfortunately, my sponsor <laughs> right here right now. Then I started doing some service work. Now mind you, this alone didn't keep me clean. So I had to come over here and I had to learn the 12 steps. I had to also have a spiritual experience or a spiritual awakening. A spiritual experience is something that happens sudden. And a spiritual awakening come as a result of the steps. And then you know what they gave me? A personality change sufficient to recover. So then I finally gained some power. I knew what to do. See, this was my problem. And then I came over here to the solution. Now, mind you, you can't just do one of them. You can't be a big book thumper and don't have no sponsor. You can't have no sponsor and don't know the big book. You also got a fellowship. But you know how they say 90 meetings in 90 days? What they tell us, Tavon? That's all it is. It's 90 meetings in 90 days. It's not enough to keep you clean. You have to have the meetings, the big book, the sponsor, and you have to do some service work. Now, if you remember, they talk about Dr. Silkworth also talk about that psychic change. That psychic change comes from spiritual experience, spiritual awakening. We have to have a complete entire psychic change sufficient to recover. Now, do I have any questions? Yes. Greg, I all the Hey, Greg. So like on the solution side, right? Mm -hmm and how you got the problem side. That whole side is the mind, mental. What side? That right there. Now, like, that side where it says spiritual experience or awakening. Yes. So that's all the mental part. Okay, well we gotta do some action. Cause remember the spiritual awakening comes as a result of the steps. Four through nine is action steps. We gotta <laughs> do some work. Now one through three, it's not no work. We don't actually have to do no work. We just have to admit that we powerless. We have to believe. And we have to make a decision. And so what we're doing is we're making a decision to put some work in. That's what we're doing in, in, in step three. We're making a decision to start doing some work. You know how we think we didn't recover because we haven't did, because uh, we've been clean for 30 or 60 days, but we ain't did no work. And then we wonder why we go back out and then we come back. Well, you ain't did no work. You ain't did no work at all. Yeah, four through nine is <coughs> putting some action behind it. Mm -hmm. And 10 through 12 is the maintenance part of the steps. That's what keeps us going. But you know how people say, my recovery is my, your recovery is your responsibility, but I don't care about him and I don't care about her. Well, where does service work come in at? Now remember, you gotta have all these. You can't just have one. Any more questions? Yes. John, I'm my God. Hey, hey, John. John. Oh, so I can't do this by myself. No, you can't. 
Listen, the worst thing we can do is think, right? So if I'm thinking and answering my own questions, I just will stay out there using. I, I need some help. I mean, if you can do it by yourself, what you're saying is you don't need no sponsor. You don't need the fellowship. And you doing it all on your own. Well, when I did it on my own, I kept on drinking. Me too. I just kept on drinking. Because, see, I think if I stop for a while, then I can go back. And it tells me, well, if I go back, I'm going to pick. I got an allergy. I'm going to pick up exactly where I left off at. Because I got that allergy. I mean, do you think I'm ever going to put on latex gloves again? No. I already know what's going to happen. So if you know if you put alcohol in your body and it's going to kick off this phenomenon craving, it's an illness. If you notice in the first edition, Dr. Silkworth is not mentioned in that first edition. And that y'all in red book? He did not want his name mentioned. When they said it was a disease, then he said, okay, now you can put my name in it. All you got to do is read the first book. The one that say AA, that it's a red and yellow book. Dr. Silkworth not listening to that. But when they said it was a disease, then he said, okay, now you can put my name in it. Because this is what, remember they thought we was crazy. They <laughs> thought they could put us in asylums and everything. They only dealt with the mind. That's all they dealt with. And they thought they could lock us up and people would be clean for 30 and 60 days. And then he wondered, Dr. Sick would wonder why they kept coming back. Because after 30 or 60 days, they would put, put some more alcohol. And this would happen right here. And that's when he realized that it was the physical and the mental. All they did was treat the mental part at the beginning. That's all they did. And that's why people wouldn't stay clean. 30 or 60 days. And then they would come back. And they wonder why they kept seeing the same people back and forth, back and forth. But ordinary for me not to put one in me, I got to continue. To, I got to do some work. And I got to continue to do some work. <coughs> Y'all have any questions back there? Yeah. That's a hard name, Donnell. Hey, hey Donnell. Donnell. So when it all first starts off, the reason a person first starts off drinking is the result of somebody else. And I say that because you said, like me, when I was young, I've been called names and those type of things. That plays a major part in someone's actually drinking. Is what well, when I start drinking, it's because everybody else was doing it. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I kept on drinking because I liked the effect it gave me. I mean, if you notice, we're not normal. Now, everybody just start drinking because that's what they do. You go to the bar, you have a drink, you go out you, to party, you have a drink. But they normal, they can stop. My sister can have some wine, she only gonna drink half of it, and I'm looking at her like, you're not gonna finish that? <laughs> <laughs> that's all she gonna drink. She feel a little bit, she gonna stop. And I'm looking at her like, okay, pass that glass over to me. <laughs> Cause see, she normal, she, she knows she feels something, yeah. she gonna stop. But the alcoholic, I'm not normal. I want to keep on going because I like the way it makes me feel. See, she don't like the way it makes her feel. She stop. I like the way it makes me feel because it takes me outside of myself. And I like that. I become somebody else. And that's, I like the effect of it. Most people don't like the effect of it. People monitor, people, you know, people drink, they get sick. Mm, I don't like getting sick. Hell, I like getting sick. To me, it made me higher. <laughs> so then I'm going to just keep on going. Yes, yeah, Shirley. How often do you have to do a course test? I mean, what they tell me is you always do an inventory. Remember, step 10 is continue to take personal inventory when we was around promptly admitted it. So if you sitting there with a bunch of resentments, which we already know is our number one offender, maybe you better put it down on paper. Because if you're doing a step 10 and you still got that resentment, then you better put it down, get with somebody, because it, it, step 5 says admit it to God, to ourselves, and another human being. So, and you, your question was, can you do it by yourself? No, you can't. It already said admitted to God, to ourselves, and another human being. Sometimes this is going to a meeting, and, and when they say, do you have a burning desire? It's telling it right then. Yeah. But you got to tell it to somebody. You need some help. You still sitting on it. So, excuse me. That's why they said this is a weed program, not an ad program. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like uh, Lorraine was saying a while ago, you know, when you try to do it alone, you know, your best thinking will get you here. So imagine if we try to do it alone, and I thank it. Where he got us at. Look at our life, the manageability of our life. So we need other people to direct us that had been there before, that had already went through this process. And like Lorraine said, we can't do it if we don't put no action into it. And you know, the action comes into 12 steps. 
Yes. Angela Athol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Athol looks to be hereditary. I mean, it's like, genetic. Yeah, you, genetic. You know what I mean? But they say it skips a generation. My immediate family weren't alcoholics. Now, my father's family was alcoholics. Okay. But if, you know, if, if I believe that, then why am I sibling's not no alcoholic? You know what I mean? Like I say, I just like what it did for me. Yes. Rebecca Alcoholic. Hey, Rebecca. Rebecca. Can you explain the difference between a spiritual experience and a spiritual awakening? Okay, so a spiritual experience is something that's going to happen sudden. Yeah. I mean, suddenly things that you used to do and things you used to feel, that's just like if he dropped $100. Before you came in here, would you have gave him back that $100? All right then. <laughs> but today, if you found a hundred dollars, wouldn't you give it back? Yes, by being honest. Okay, that's something that's happened a sudden. Suddenly, you just start feeling different. You want to do things different. Matter of fact, you want some recovery. When I when I had a spiritual, I didn't even know it. Let me tell you something. My spiritual experience happened before I even came here, and I didn't even know what it was. What I'm saying is, I was sitting in my apartment, and it won't that I was, didn't have no 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 more. Uh, uh, drugs or anything to get high off. What happened was I just got tired and I asked God to help me. It wasn't until I came here that I realized I had a spiritual experience, what it was. Just something hit me all of a sudden and what I knew was I didn't want to do it no more. Yeah. That's a spiritual experience. Do we have them over and over and over again? Yes, we do. You know what I mean? For 15 years I took care of everybody else. Now I won't take care of me. Somewhere God showed up and I had a spiritual experience and it was about me. But you know, I got that from doing work. If you continue to do work, like somebody asked about a fourth step, well, we already know if we rest on our laws, what happened? Mm. You want to have people with 18, 19 years used? Yeah. Because they rest on their laws. They, don't, they feel like they ain't got to do no more work. I've been clean 15 years. I done did a fourth step, what, four or five times? I'm not going to rest on my laws. Yes. You just give her ask a question. Oh, top on alcohol. Hey, hey top on. So like that's why sponsorship is so important because like when you start sponsoring people, you continue to work the steps while you helping somebody else. Yes. Yeah. And if you're not doing the work yourself, how are you gonna help somebody else? Mm. So you just continue on. That's how we uh, stay in in recovery, maintain our maintenance. And the step is the maintenance of our recovery. If we don't do that, then you know, hey, we'll be back out there running. And a lot of people, when they rest on their priorities and stuff like that, feel I arrived. You hear that a lot of time, where people feel that they arrived, they don't have to do anything else. Yeah. Now, mind you, it's 12 steps. This is the only one we got to do 100%. It's hmm. step one. But some people feel after they did step one, they ain't got to do <laughs> nothing else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then you wonder why they use again. They ain't changed nothing. They feel like that's all they got to do. Matter of fact, they ain't even came over here and did this. It's a spiritual program. Mm. Mental. Physical. And spiritual. And most people leave the spiritual part out. Now, in order to get the spiritual part, you got to do some work. Yes, Miss Pam. Hi, I'm Pam. Hey, hey, ma'am. Um, yeah, can you explain service work? Service work is like what I come to work and do every day. What Miss V come to work and do every day. I mean, helping another alcoholic is service work. Service work is going to a meeting, finding your home group, and going in there doing coffee and setting up all the time. Every, every week. Not just going to your meeting one day and then for two or three weeks you miss it. That's service work. Service work is helping another alcoholic. If an alcoholic called me and say, I, I want some help, I want to go to detox. Now, I ain't going to get them by myself. I don't care. <laughs> I'm not. But I'm going to call another alcoholic, and I might go get them. That's service work. Service work is telling your story. I spend strength and hope. You know what I mean? To another alcoholic. That's service work. And we got to continue doing that. Yes. Alcoholic named Donnell. Hey, Donnell. Now, I asked a guy to speak at my home group, right? He got about five, six years clean, but he told me he don't speak at home groups or nothing like that. Then it was another guy that spoke the other day. He said he don't sponsor people, but he got multiple years clean. Is that like a, like a not doing service work or 
<laughs> you know, no, I mean, is it required that a person? Well, let me do just tell you what like I was that. told. If I'm asked, I need to do it. Now, fear do kick in with some people. Fear kick in with me. But I was told if I was asked, I need to do it. I need to get outside myself and do it. And that means I'm helping somebody. I can't speak on anybody else. But that's what I was told. If I'm asked, I need to do it. Yes. Khalif back up. Hey, Khalif. All right, see, with the mental obsession, right, mm -hmm. the, you say we mental obsessed though because we like the effect. All right, so if we never had nothing in us, are we able to mental obsess over? You can't mental obsess over nothing you ain't never put in your body. Okay. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I can't obsess over drinking if I ain't never had a drink. Have you ever heard of an alcoholic that ain't never had a drink? <laughs> I mean, you know, not being funny, I'm just saying. You know what I mean? Yes. Christine Alcoholic. Hey, Christine. So this also explains how this is a feelings disease. Why do you say that? Because we initially we start drinking because we like the effect and how it makes us feel. And then once we make once we start drinking, the way it makes us feel mentally and physically when we're using. Okay, now remember, we don't start drinking because we like the way it feels because we don't know it's going to change the way we feel. Mm -hmm. So basically, we start drinking because that's the norm. That's mm -hmm. what people do. They got bars, liquor stores. But once we drink, we don't drink because of the way we feel. We drink because of the way it makes us feel, because right. of the effects. So that's why we keep on drinking. Right. Because we like the way it makes us feel once we put one in. Is that why we start drinking? No. Then when when I had a beer, I didn't know it was going to make me feel like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was just doing it because that's what everybody else did. Right. But then it just did something to me because I, I, I'm not normal. See, I ain't know I suffer with this disease. See, I, I didn't know I needed to be away from comfort because I ain't know I was uncomfortable. Yeah. I thought that was the norm for me to feel that way. And then I got some liquor in me and I realized that was not the norm. That it took me away from feeling that way, and oh my God, so I got some, I thought it gave me some power. What I didn't know was I was powerless. I lost all control of yeah. my life. I thought it gave me some power to do something. Yeah. And it got me, got me in all sorts of trouble. Any more questions? Yes. Hey, Greg, I go up. Hey, hey Greg. Greg. So you're saying that I can't <coughs> pour a liquor into juice or nothing and drink it? <laughs> Go ahead. Jim, Jim did that. Jim did that, and what happened? <laughs> what? What? It was. It is with. Yeah. Now, man, you you know it's funny, but a bunch of us thought that. Cause I, you know, I was drinking it, and I thought, I mean, for real, that if I put orange juice with my gin, that I'm gonna get drunk. But. You think because you got orange juice in it, it ain't going to kick off this phenomenon of craving? So if I put whipped cream on my strawberries, I'm allergic to strawberries, I'm going to be all right? But the strawberries still in the whipped cream? I mean, something wrong with that, right? I mean, we got to think of it like that. I'm still going to break out even though I got whipped cream and I can dip it in chocolate if I want to. But if I'm allergic to strawberries and strawberries in it, then it's going to kick off that allergy and I'm going to break out. And a lot of people think like you think. I mean, it's in the big book. I mean, when Mama Bill, what? Mix his with milk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happened? Went on a on the spree. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? So the bottom line is total what? Abstinence. You know, that's uh, with this new stuff where they got them on Suboxone mm -hmm. and they go get the shot and all that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ain't nothing but a band aid. Yeah. You just put a band aid over something. But when you take that band aid off, guess what? If it ain't been treated, you're going to go on that what? Yeah. It said total absent. Right. That's it. Ain't no way to treat it. Total absent. I mean, remember, this stuff you got to do 100%. It didn't say 50%. So you want to mix it with orange juice, so you're going to do 50% of it. And you still think. That you're gonna get into the solution by doing 50 percent of step one, and you got to do 100. Yes, Miss Pam. Right. Um, I am Pam alcoholic. Amen. I am a chronic alcoholic. Probably more so than most people in here. I have a mental obsession that I can go and get drunk off of rubbing alcohol. Um, 
hand sanitizer. You know, I don't, why do I obsess with stuff like that? I mean, I'm not, I'm away from that now, but I'm asking about why did I? I mean, just because it said alcohol on the bottle? Okay, listen, because remember, we restless, irritable, and discontent. Now, if you still obsessing over evidence, you no, I'm just saying, you ain't did no work. You got to do some work. Because, listen, we wake up restless, irritable, and discontent, but the steps show me how to get out of that if that's what I want to do. Yeah. I can remain in that right. and then come minute obsess over making me feel better, or I can do something different. Yeah. I mean, you think when I wake up every morning, I want to come in here and deal with y'all? Mm. So I do what, what don't make me feel good, and I get out the bed and I come in here. Because I know if I stay in the bed, I'm going to remain restless, irritable, and discontent. That desire going to kick in that I want something to make me feel better, and I'm going to end up putting something in me. Yeah. Yes. I'm sure I'm not Hey, Shirley. You know, when, when people talk about disease a whole lot of time, like glorifying disease, does they normally go back to you? I don't understand what you mean when you say glorified. You, know, you sit around and glorify the, the disease. You just talk about your past and how it was and laugh and joke about it all the time. That's what I'm talking about. You know, when you just sit around, that's all you talk about is disease, what you used to do, and the war story. What it sounds like to me is you ain't had no spiritual experience or no spiritual awakening. Okay. What it sounds like to me is you're still in the problem okay. and you ain't over here in the solution. Okay. Now, remember. I'm, I'm going to go back to your question and why you sit. You, you got to do this 100%. So if you got alcohol in it, if, if you still got a mental obsession, that means you ain't completely succumb to the fact that you are alcoholic. You just, well, like, like he said, can I mix orange juice in it? I mean, if I go to church and I'm going to have communion, com communion I want to know whether or not it's wine or grapefruit juice. Yeah. And all I'm getting is a sip. And that's all it takes for me, is a sip, just a taste on that tongue. I mean, you know, it, it does something. It just warms me up and everything. I mean, just a little <laughs> sip. I mean, I mean, for real, we yeah. alcoholics. Yeah. I mean, just, just, just a taste. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if somebody bring me something, in, you think I'm, I found this bag. You think I'm going to open the bag and taste it? Mm. I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I'm not going to take the top off the bottle and, 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 and take that little sip. And for it to find out it's alcohol and I'm an alcoholic, I'm not going to do that. Because it's going, it's going to do something to me. It's going to kick off this allergy and this phenomenon craving. That's what it's going to do for me. So I'm going to tell you, throw it away. Matter of fact, I'm going to look at you crazy like why you're bringing it to me. Mm. Any more questions? Okay, so we're going to end this session of the disease concept. Thank you.